Welcome back to another edition of the Unofficial Guide Disney Dish Podcast with Jim Hill. This is a video podcast, and for this edition, we've decided to take your questions. So you guys have submitted about uh, two dozen questions, which I am going to now ask Jim. Just a word of warning, neither Jim or I have seen these questions in advance, so uh, the, the results are completely unpredictable. All right, so let's start with a question from Robert F. Mm -hmm. uh, can you go over which resorts are the most and least profitable and also, which resorts are the most high and low maintenance? Ooh. All right. Um, lowest profits for... So it's interesting, right? Because you've got the... Uh, the the luxe resorts tend to be smaller, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. charge more money. Yep. Right? And the, the value resorts, I mean, the, the All-Stars and uh, Pop Century are 3,600 rooms and change. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but this is kind of a fluid situation. I mean, I think we just talked about what's going on with Art of Animation, that mm. you know, they have this spectacular new facility they brought online last year, and yet it's really not proving to be the profit center that they thought, because people are actually balking at the price point. I mean, they're like, wow, I can get a, a room, a suite, and how much? Yeah, 300 bucks a night, 350 yeah. Yeah, and, and the reality is that you look at that and you figure, well, I can buy, what, I can get two rooms at the All-Star? For less or, than that? Or a complete house offsite. Yes, yeah. yes. And so it's like, all right. I, I don't care how good the bathrooms are at Art of Animation. <laughs> we're not, we're not 350 Yeah, so it, it really is kind of a fluid situation. As for maintenance, um, you know, just in the past week or so, we, we've seen that, that, you know, the problem with some with some of the older buildings, I mean, mm -hmm. did you heard about the window breaking at the Contemporary? I heard a bird flew into it. Yeah, so this was a, this was a window breaking above Chef Mickey's at yep. the Contemporary yep. and essentially raining glass down on people. Mm -hmm. But it was a, uh, I heard it was, it was birds. Well, that, that, that there is also an issue with this giant birds. birds. Yes. <laughs> Nobody actually saw the bird. Yeah, oh, my God. No it, was a, it was a bird. Uh, it's, it's actually, from, from what I've been hearing, the problem is you have this giant concrete structure mm -hmm. that you built in Florida in mm -hmm. the land of the sinkhole. Yeah. And it's settling. You know, and it's yeah. just sort of like the, the various stresses. But you have this older building. It's that, heating and contracting. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah it's spinning it, and contracting, it, heating and cooling. And, yeah. and eventually, you know, you, you have to deal with these issues. Yeah. So, um, it, it, from a maintenance point of view, I've heard, for example, that uh, the Grand Floridian is particularly a nightmare because... Really? Well, it, it just, just think about maintaining all of those little cupolas and keeping oh, yeah, things yeah, white and of, red. Uh, and, oh, so the gingerbread detail of the Victorian. Yeah, I mean, it just makes you yeah, crazy. Yeah. I, and That's a big resort, too. It's a huge yeah, resort. Yeah. And so, you know, in theory, what they should be doing is starting to paint it, and when they get to the other end, they just pick up where they began. Yeah. But, this isn't that Disney company anymore, so. Wow, interesting. So. There's another question from, uh, from Robert. Uh, can you discuss the overall wait and see attitude of recent, recently of Disney execs for Walt Disney World expansion? Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily the execs as much as the board of directors who control the purse strings. Yeah, I mean, This is a rare instance of corporate governance that may actually go right. Well, um, but there is another factor here. That, that, that uh, the hard reality is when they opened Animal Kingdom in 1998, mm -hmm. Um, they immediately saw, they, they thought, oh, wow, we're going to see people extend their vacations. We're going to see that much more people come to the resort. But what actually really happened was cannibalism. Uh, not in the human... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not familiar oh, with that land in the animal kingdom. <laughs> forget about going to the food court. I'm getting myself a toddler. Uh, no, this, this was about how uh, cannibalism in a theme park uh, point of view, that, that if people were deciding to go to animal kingdom, they were then shaving... A day or a half day off of Epcot or Disney Hollywood Studios. You buy a park hopper pass I mean, and do both parks. They always one. go to the kingdom, but yeah. the other, you know, it was together like, no, no, we're not. You know, just we only have so much time. In fact, that's what kind of fascinates me about Magic Bands and the Disney experience because it's like, yes, you've created this technology that you're putting on somebody's wrist. And yes, it does make it that much easier to get a churro. You know, <laughs> or go to the park. But it doesn't mean because you put your magic band on, you now have ten thousand more dollars to spend in your Disney vacation. Yeah. You still have the same amount of money. It just means you're spending a little faster. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. Again, it's one of these ideas that somebody just eh, will make money, and it's like, well, it's the same money only. Different. Yeah, it's not like a consumer's pocketbooks are, are increasing no. because of the magic bands. No. So. Huh. Interesting idea. Good question. Mm -hmm. Very cool.